Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the channel. I am joined here by the CEO of BioHarvest Sciences, Ilan Sobel. And uh, we're going to have a little interview here today. You, you've, um, you've, got me, you've got me at a good time, Brennan, after a long day's work on, on a Sunday evening here in Israel. <laughs> well, we'll try to make it brief. Uh, no problem. I'm all yours. I'm all yours and I'm all, your, I'm all, the, I'm all yours in the whole channel. <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. That's exactly what I want to hear. All right. Um, when it comes to the uh, bioplant solicitation process, does the company elicit the desired secondary metabolites uh, before the cells are cryopreserved in the cell bank, or is it done within the bioreactor? The solicitation process happens in the bioreactors, and that's where we're you know leveraging our our unique uh, capabilities from an overall cannabinoid tuning perspective. Awesome, awesome. Um, uh, and a follow-up question is, are the- but, other... but, but I must tell you, Yeah. the selection of cells from the plant itself initially is a critical part of our IP as well, okay? It's almost like it's like a, a very unique um, AI system that we built over the last um, you know 15 years to be able to recognize which cells and from where to take. So I can't under I can't you know uh, emphasize this enough that yes, what we do, obviously in our closed bioreactor systems is very important, but you know, having something really quality from a, uh, an overall sales perspective is, is critical. Okay. And there's some super, super smart things we know what to do in that area that we've learned as a result of you know, 15 years of le learnings starting with the red grape all the way through to the olive and the pomegranate that, you know, have helped us enormously as we, as we moved on to cannabis. Uh, and then I want to ask the follow-up question. Um, are the elicitors used for uh, cannabis interchangeable between the strains um, or uh, are they all different? So that's, that's a very good question. And I'm not prepared to answer that because that's going too close to our know-how. And yeah. so I, I know that you and the rest of the channel will respect that there's only so much that I can lean in. Absolutely. I totally respect that. I totally understand. Um, and um, I wanted to ask, with the real possibility of uh, uh, credit freezing up due to worsening economic conditions, and illiquidity in financial markets, does the company believe uh, they're in a good financial position to deal with a much slower global economy? I believe that um, with the capabilities that we've built up until now and the ability for the company to consistently demonstrate our ability to convert those capabilities into execution, and execution into results that we are very strong and stable and will be able to withhold um, any kind of additional slowdown that one may expect on the horizon. And that's really, you know, driven by investors' confidence in the technology platform, in the leadership team, and our ability to consistently execute and deliver what we say we're going to deliver deliver on, and um, and so for that I have a lot of confidence that no, no matter how challenging the horizon gets, we have the people, the leadership, the capabilities, and investor confidence to be able to ride through this. And uh, with the world's demographics projected to slow down drastically in the coming decades with uh, fewer births and an ever-increasing aging population, uh, does the company view this as a tailwind for not just Vinia, but the other nutraceuticals within its portfolio? 
Look, Sorry, but... um, that's okay. The, the you know the let's call it the the aging of the global population largely, I think is is a tremendous tremendous um, tailwind for us, um, because when you look at our polyphenol antioxidant products, a product line that we have, um, starting with Vinia, it it's totally you know, centers in many respects on the aging process, right? That extra physical energy on the cardiovascular space with the extra physical energy, mental alertness, um, all the way through to, you know, um, the benefits that we provide as far as uh, helping to maintain blood pressure already within normal ranges, providing um, overall support from an overall heart health perspective, all the way through to reducing oxidation of LDL cholesterol that's part of the aging process, all the way to, you know, reducing uh, damage, overall cell damage. And that's also part of the aging process. So that whole, that all of those benefits, you know, the, the, the aging process or the, the aging of the global population ties very, very closely into this. And then importantly, Brandon, we, uh, we haven't spoken about this a lot, and we will probably start to talk more about it in the next, um, let's call it the next uh, two to four months. But we have a number of clinicals that uh, our Dr. Brian um, is focusing on working with some pretty significant institutions. And all of those clinicals also play very strongly into, um, into the overall, you know, dealing with specific um, overall health and wellness conditions that are, are largely developed through the aging process. So this is going to be, you know, very, this is going to be very exciting for us as we look at additional overall health benefit claims that we're going to make on Vinia. And also as we start to look at other use cases for Vinia, you know, remember now we're, you know, when we're north of 15,000, you know, active customers, if not, if not more. And, um, and, and we're starting to get amazing uh, data points, which give us a lot of confidence as we go into some of these areas. Um, again, very much in, in, in sync with the aging process. And there's just going to be a tremendous demand. You know, everybody, the, the amount of um, investment that's going into longevity as people try, you know, are looking at ways to live longer, but also to live better as they go through the aging process is significant. And we really believe, oops, you got, you've got a, you've got, we're live here and you've got a power failure or something here. Let me check what's happened. <laughs> and I was saying, I'll finish off up on this. Um, but yeah, this really plays into our, our sweet spot. Give me one second. I'm going to check what's going on here. One second. Okay. Uh, we're back. All right. <laughs> Why did you must have pressed something? So you can see you're going, you're, you're, you're pretty much live here in the Sobel household. <laughs> <laughs> um, so hopefully, yeah, that's, that's, that's a, I think, a good perspective on that question. Uh, that's a good response, absolutely. Um, and uh, with higher cannabinoid levels and the possibility of uh, higher bioavailability of the company's cannabis and hemp products, are these both elements that are uh, factored into the ca um, calculation of comparing bioharvest production versus um, uh, traditional cannabis production? Um, so when you look at the, um, they, they are, I'll answer you this way. Um, we're always going to be as conservative as possible. And we always want to under promise and over deliver. That's all we try and do. Um, and I think you've seen that consistently. If you look at everything that I've shared with our investor partners since I came into the business, you know, uh, in June 2020, you know, we've, you know, we have a record for delivering what we say we're going to do. So when I talk about, you know, 60 to 70 percent reduction in overall costs from a cannabis perspective versus a traditional, you know, average of indoor grow. I think it's pretty conservative. Um, I would say that, you know, that, that benchmarking that we did um, was, was done um, not, not comparing bubble hash to bubble hash, 
if it was bubble hash, it would probably be a, a much greater reduction in cost. Again, being conservative, it's more of a benchmarking of comparing our bubble hash to, to flour, right? Um, so again, it's conservative on, on our side. And also, um, there, are, there are a number of factors that we know we can drive additional cost reduction uh, from, which, which haven't been factored in as well. So, you know, um, and also importantly, if you look at the costs of the multi-state operators, when we did the benchmarking, it was probably, we were doing this about maybe four or five months ago. And uh, the world has changed drastically in the last, call it six months, from an overall cost perspective. You've seen inflation go through the roof. You see in markets like in, you know, specifically in North America, labor costs have, have increased significantly just given uh, you know, supply shortages. And you've seen energy costs increase significantly. So when we've done the benchmarking, we were looking at averages, which were pretty much prior to this period. So I think it's a it's a conservative um, it's conservative again. If you look at bubble hash, if you compare bubble hash to bubble hash, right? You actually look at bubble hash today. Um, you know, I don't want to get into numbers, but but it's it's probably you know bubble hash is from what what I've seen is probably two and a half to three and a half times more uh, versus the cost of flour at least because you've got the labor costs required to actually do the um, the specific filtering of the trichomes and and doing the ice bath and the filtering of the trichomes. So I, when I do this, you know, I'm not comparing, I'm not comparing our bubble hash to bubble hash. It would be a much greater reduction in cost if I if I compare bubble hash to bubble hash. It'll probably be, you know, maybe 75 to 90 percent lower. All right. But what we've talked about here is compared to, you know, let's call it average flour. Average producing, you know, cannabinoid flour that's being sold in the market. So hopefully that clarifies it, and that's where we'll keep it, right? As we, when we look at the number of sixty to seventy percent lower. I see. Yeah, that does make a lot more sense when you put it that way. Um, with uh, with Vinia being listed on Amazon in the United States, is there a time frame of when Canadians can expect to see it on um, the Canadian Amazon website? So we are working super hard with our partners in Canada to get Vinia actually fully registered in Canada with Health Canada, right? Um, and I, I'm I'm cautiously optimistic that by second quarter next year, worst case third quarter, we'll be fully registered to sell in Canada, which means we can really actively sell because right now, you know, our Canadian customers who've been you know super patient with us. As you probably know, they're only able to able to receive based on Canadian uh, legal guidelines three months of vinia at any stage. And there's also, you know, depending on how it's sent and and who's receiving the vinia on the customs side, you have a varying uh, amount of uh, customs duty that's charged, uh, which we really don't have a lot of control over. Um, so we we really, you know, we we we're not happy about that. And obviously, you know, we. We want to make sure that our, our Canadian customers, many of our Canadian um, investor partners, that we're able to, you know, um, sell them vinia in the same way that we're able to in the U.S. And we believe the demand in Canada is is significant as well. So, you know, that for us is is really important. What I would call horizontal growth for the company that we'll be looking at for next year, and we, we're making great progress already with Health Canada. We've 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 we've, we've gone quite well through the process. That's good to hear. Yeah, because there's lots of people that would really benefit from uh, more accessibility to Vinia yeah. account, for sure. Um, so the company has made it clear that it is currently pursuing a partnership with a pre-existing cannabis producer. Can you kind of expand on what exactly uh, that relationship would look like? Um, the, um, I think our shareholder partners will receive um, a lot more information about this, I would expect, you know, in the, in the near term. But like I've said, um, like I've said um, last week, you know, we're looking for um, partners that are the right partners from a long-term perspective, 
And this is really critical. These are partners that share the same values to buy harvest values, because ultimately we are, we're looking for what we, we would call like an anchor partner. These are one or two partners that can take significant geographic territories and, and run with bio harvest you know, technology. Um, so it's partners that are currently operating in the right markets, markets that work to our advantage based on the different um, strains that we have and the different focus areas. These are partners that have consistent values to us. Um, you know, I think what's also important to understand is that as we look to build our aspiration of a multi-billion dollar biotech company, people need to understand we're not a cannabis company, right? You know, we are a biotech company with platform technology. And, um, you know, we want to make sure we're choosing the best partners in those verticals that we decide to, you know, to partner with key operators on the ground to execute flawlessly. And these are partners that we want, want to make sure are able to take maximum advantage of our technology to create value, both the human utility value for the consumer on the ground plus shareholder value. And that also means a partner that we believe is going to be able to you know, work with us with clear roles and responsibilities. We will always be doing the R&D. We will always be doing the manufacturing, but we need to have the right partner that's able to take the finished product and to be able to execute that and sell it across you know, the market, across the product line in a way that's going to create value. And that also means a partner that's not going to suck us in from a resource perspective, it's gonna also give us the oxygen to be able to ensure that we're creating value on the ground in the territory, but also it gives us oxygen to move on to the next vertical or to move on to other priorities of the company. As we look to build a multi-billion dollar biotech company with platform technology, leveraging this platform technology across multiple verticals to create value. I see. So the company would be focusing on supplying the cannabis and the partner would be the one distributing it. I see. I see. Okay. Um, and uh, I'm really curious about this question. Uh, with lab grown meat having a real possibility of eventually becoming a product on our grocery shelves in our near uh, future, could you expand a little into how bioharvest could play a role in that industry with uh, protein growth factors? Um, that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, I think, um, based on where the world is going today, you know, I often wonder, um, what my children, as they grow up, I have a 17 year old, a 14 year old and a 10 year old. And, you know, will they be visiting the butcher shop in the same way that I go to the butcher shop, you know, every Friday morning to prepare for our, our Sabbath meal? You know, what will it look like for their shopping experience or their children's shopping experience? And I think it's going to be a very different experience as the world starts to, you know, realign themselves based on, you know, our, our critical need to protect the planet, as well as that, you know, going back to your original question around longevity and making sure that, you know, we are, we are all um, consuming the, the best possible, you know, array of, of products from a protein perspective all the way through to carbohydrates which which you know best fit fit the needs of our of our overall um, functioning of our bodies I do believe that um, in that space a big challenge is cost major major challenge is you know really being able to scale um, that that particular industry and all associated industries whether it's you know, you know basically, um, um, uh, specifically meat that's grown from cells, chicken, all the way through to actual fish. Um, the biggest challenge is scalability and getting it to the price points that are able to bring consumers into those categories. Um, you know, it's taste and price point, and then obviously the health factors which go with it. Um, obviously, protein growth factors is a is a is a very important driver of that cost today. 
Um, today, those protein growth factors are mammalian. So they're actually, you know, animal driven growth factors. And I believe in the future, the opportunity will be around deriving those growth factors from plants. And of course, you know, there's only one company out there, we believe, right, that has the capability to be able to do that. And that's something that, you know, our platform, should we decide to do that, is something that we believe um, with the right R&D and resources that uh, over time we can, you know, definitely have a good chance of cracking. But this, this is one of the opportunities that as a company we've talked about um, exploring as we look at additional verticals. And there's a number of other areas that we're, that we're you know, obviously closely exploring. And also making sure that, um, you know, we, we allocate, as we've seen, Brennan, the amount of opportunity just in Vinia today, right? I think when we start to see, when, you know, when we, as we see, and we saw already the third quarter, just from six weeks sales momentum that we had, um, and, you know, I didn't get into this in the shareholder uh, meeting, but obviously, you know, we had we had a lot of activity already in early fourth quarter, which has been very, very encouraging. And we start to see these opportunities just in a market, just it's just the U.S., right? You know, um, huge opportunity, let alone you go to markets like, you know, looking at um, Europe, you look aging population and all the challenge and all the opportunities there. Uh, that come with the challenges that the aging process um, you know, provides um, all the way through to China. You look at China, you know, as you know, our Pisces resveratrol from the skin of the red grape is very unique because the other form of resveratrol, which is from polyginum, is actually in China today. You are not able to sell locally in China resveratrol from polyginum the Chinese are really smart and they understand some of the challenges that polygonum has from an overall traditional Chinese medicine perspective as it relates to side effects, right? So China in the future presents a tremendous opportunity as does the rest of Southeast Asia, I think you know, Indonesia, Philippines, all these markets. So there's just on Vinia is a huge opportunity. And as, we, as you know, we're starting to see so many other use cases on Vinia as we look at different indications that blood flow is so, so, such an important uh, um, critical factor in impacting these uh, indications. You know, we've talked about gingivitis, we talked about, you know, erectile dysfunction, all these, you know, there's, and then it goes on and on and on as we start to understand more and more about the importance of blood flow. So you just take Vinia and you look at the opportunities. Then you have the olive cells, then you have the pomegranate cells. Then we have cannabis, right? And you see the, the, the massive, massive disruption we can drive in all of these areas, let alone cannabis itself, right? We've got to just make sure that we can walk and chew gum and that we, we are, we're making sure that we're, we're focusing where we need to focus most to be able to create the most human utility value and share all the value. But knowing that as you look at this company, you know, five years out, we won't be a two vertical company. We'll probably be a three vertical company. And within those verticals, we will play in dietary supplements. We may play as well in botanical drugs. And you know, that just represent, represents a tremendous, tremendous opportunity to create human utility value and you know, you know, a, a enormous amount of shareholder value with that. And then with supply disruptions being experienced globally, um, has the company experienced any problems uh, in regards to say like uh, the media, the growth medium, or even uh, the bioreactors themselves? Look, we have an amazing team that works on our supply chain side of the business. It's an excellent cross-functional team. We have really good partners, very good um, sourcing, uh, protocols and you know so far we've been able to uh, ensure that these areas are not pressure points uh, for the company and I don't see them as being uh, major pressure points for the company affecting our growth trajectory. That's great to hear. Um, let's see. Uh, sorry one second here. Um, no 
Oh, here we go. Um, in the last shareholder update, it was mentioned that Vinia Supply was having a tough time trying to meet demand. Will the company consider expanding from 20 plus tons of Vinia production to the well over 60 tons of production as what was highlighted in the original manufacturing agreement with Sugart back in 2020? So a couple of things. The, the challenges that we've had is just, you know, we, we, we've had a number of surges, massive surges. As we lean in with our marketing, we see massive surges, right? So, you know, for example, the Eric Metaxas interview, we, we, we reached a very large demographic and we just, we were just blown away by the, um, the, the huge surge that we saw on our site and then on Amazon, right? Um, similarly, you know, we, we've, we had similar surges uh, as far as, um, you know, uh, last week's Huckabee show. So this, this kind of makes planning a little bit uh, difficult when you just, you know, you, you don't have that experience curve yet on what, you, what to expect when you reach broader demographics. Um, and, and that's been a little bit challenging for us, but we've actually done pretty well. And we've, uh, I think very well, actually. And we've been able to so far deliver on our customer promise to all of those customers when they come into our funnel and we tell them how many days it's going to take to get Vinia to them. We've, we've delivered on all of their expectations. Um, and so I think, you know, we've handled that you know, very well. We haven't had any, you know, customer management issues. And that's really important for us because, we pride ourselves, and and um, Jackie and the team, um, they have a you know they have a deliverable of being the best customer service organization in the industry, with you know just a relentless focus on what I call you know servant leadership from a customer perspective, right? Um, so we 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 I think we've managed that very professionally and extremely well, and you know. Now that we've got, got basically, we're, we're continuing to drive the scale up, more bioreactors, you know, we're, we're, we're upping the ante on, um, on the amount of, that we're producing every single, literally every single cycle um, as we start to kind of move up from a capacity perspective. You know, we will, I believe next year, be pushing that 20, I always call it a 20 plus ton facility. Because I believe through smart efficiencies, we can actually get more than 20 tons out of that facility. How much more is really just dependent on a number of, um, of efficiency uh, measures that we're taking. And there's a number of measures that we have, in, um, we have planned to be able to try and maximize how much we get out of that facility. But obviously, we're starting to think about you know, the mega plant. Because you know, if if we if what we've seen in, in, you know as far as sales momentum, and again, importantly, something that I'm super psyched about is that you know as we've gone bigger and broader and bringing in thousands more customers, Brennan, the customer reviews are amazing. Or literally, like I was just looking at some reviews that came through. Literally, like you know, um, a couple, you know, you know, maybe like 15, 20 minutes ago before I got on the call. And it's just, you know, super, absolutely super, super inspiring, you know. Um, I'll read this one to you. I saw this advertised on a program. I listened carefully and thought if all the statements were true that I could use this product. I'm a skeptical person, but decided to give it a try. I found that my energy level through the day is better and stamina has increased. At 65, I still think I can do what I once did. Well, I can't, and we all understand that, but I will say that Vinia has given me an increase in energy and stamina, and I will continue on it. Thank you, Vinia team. I mean, five-star review. This is just, you know, one of, you know, one of the 10, 15, 20. I think I know many people watch how many reviews and how many they uh, how many, how much the reviews increase every single day or every single week. And you can see that building up. So it's just, it's amazing to see the, the quality of the reviews that we're getting. Um, and that gives me a lot of confidence that we have to start thinking now about where we're going to put that mega plant. Uh, that you know, and it, it would be you know from the confidence we're getting now, and if that momentum you know continues, and I don't see any reason why not, as we start to scale our marketing, because honestly, we're not spending crazy money on marketing in the U.S. Right? It's super super efficient what we're doing, and we're getting you know, an amazing return on investment. 
or as they say, ROAS, return on advertising spend. Um, but as we start to lean in with more resources and put more on the marketing, and you're also getting the power of word of mouth, there's nothing better. You take this particular review, this person's going to tell five, 10 people about their experience on, on Vinia. You know this, you're on it, your grandmother's on it. And yeah. you know how many friends have investor partners like you brought into, into the Vinia into the vineyard trademark. So, yeah, you definitely know, a compounding effect for sure. Exactly. There's a compound effect. And so right now, you know, it gives me the, the confidence to say humbly, humbly, I feel like we, we're starting to earn the right to actually start to think about where's that next facility going to be, mm -hmm. you know, because we've got to start planning. We don't want to be, we don't want to be caught with, you know, significant demand and not be able to supply that demand. So, um, you know, and specifically, we, we, we're we just talking about a one SKU right now, right? We've yeah. got um, protein bars that we're working really hard on. We've got the chews we're working hard on. We've got um, additional, you know, indications which we're going to go after on Vinia as well as we see results of some of the additional clinical trials we're going to be running. We've got olive cells and, you know, same thing with olive cells. It's the same playbook. We'll go capsules, we'll go protein bars. And similarly with, um, as we look at uh, pomegranate. So there's, you know, I do believe that as we start to think about the future and scaling just the polyphenol antioxidant business, which in itself can be, you know, a multi hundred million dollar business on the revenue line that we will need more capacity. You know, you know maybe it's in 12 months, maybe it's 18, 24, and we're gonna start thinking about it shortly. Well, I don't want to keep you for much longer. I know you've had a really long day and you're tired. So <laughs> I just want to say thank you for joining me today for an interview. And uh, hopefully we can do this again. No problems. We, we appreciate, obviously, um, the partnership that you've had with the company for, you know, really since I started. I think one of my first few interviews was with you, Brennan, and, and just obviously your support it's great that you're such a believer in Vinia based on your experience and based on your grandmother's experience. Um, and we really appreciate the time and the energy that you, you take to, to provide um, as much information as possible to other shareholder partners. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's partners like yourself and, and many hundreds, maybe thousands of people out there that are going to uh, really are helping us collectively build this amazing company um, and really change the world in many respects. And that's one of the things that, you know, for Justin and I, it's super exciting because we're not doing this by ourselves. We have a whole team of shareholder partners. And, and I think you understand the amount of, um, you know, pretty much every day I'm getting emails from shareholder partners providing, um, you know, even links to things that I should be looking at. You know, I, my, I can't be everywhere. There's only so many hours I can work a day. Um, by providing some perspectives on on certain areas of thought leadership. And, you know, it's super helpful. Uh, it really is one team, one dream that are building this company to make a, you know, transformational difference in people's lives, impacting, you know, please God, you know, millions, if not tens of millions of people in the future. So that's what makes me super excited. And, and we're doing it as a team. So thank you. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm thanking you on behalf of all the other investor partners. Well, thank you. That makes me feel really good, actually. Uh, I, I hope I was able to uh, nail a few points in the latest video. Yeah, I think your video was awesome. I enjoyed it. I'm not going to comment on, <laughs> uh, on some of your hypotheses on the technology, but I, I super, you know, super appreciative of the time, the, the energy that you put into um, a lot of the research that you did. And as you've seen, you know, I've seen all, all the comments and, and the favorable comments that the other investor partners have provided towards you and you deserve it. You did a, you did a really good job.